Thank you for joining us for this informative American Institute of Chemical Engineers webinar sponsored by Providence Consulting, everything you wanted to know about release systems but were too afraid to ask. Our speaker is Justin Phillips. Justin Phillips has over eight years of onshore and offshore oil and gas process engineering and project execution experience. His technical experience includes process design with specialty in flare and relief systems. Justin is the Relief Systems Line of Service Manager at Providence Consulting. He holds a BS in Chemical Engineering from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas, and is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Texas. <clears throat> One quick note before I turn this session over to Justin. As described more fully on the slide, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers assumes no legal liability or responsibility for the use or misuse of the content in this webinar. And now I'd like to welcome Justin Phillips. Hi, Justin. Hi, Pam. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, again, thank you to you, Pam, and thank you to AICHE for allowing us to sponsor these webinars. I always really enjoy giving them. Um, and the, today's webinar, I think over the, over the past several webinars, I think this may be my sixth, Every single time we have a webinar, I get the most excited and I feel like there is the most value in the question and answer session. And usually we relegate that to the last 10 or 15 minutes of a webinar. And so for today's webinar, I think the, the idea that I had was, well, if questions and answers seem to be so popular and we get so many after the webinars are concluded, why don't we just have one webinar that's dedicated to nothing but Q&A? And so that's really the purpose of today's webinars, to go over questions, um, that have been submitted to AICHE, most of them anonymously for folks that just have questions that are just too shy to ask um, or have not had the opportunity to ask before. Um, it's a little bit of a different format for me. We are going to have some time towards the end of the webinar for some additional questions and answers. Um, I will try to stick to the time constraints that I have with all of the material that I have. We received a lot of questions and I tried to answer as many as I could. Some of them I could not, and some were really, really good questions that were just beyond my ability to answer in such a, a short amount of time. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So I tried to, to move everything into 16 different compartments, and you can look at the, the things that we're gonna um, talk about today. The first item is actually missing. It's, it's not showing up. Where did it go? Two-phase flow, there we go. Um, Two-phase flow, discharge location and effluent handling, rupture disks, all types of really fun stuff. Um, and it's not that there's 16 questions, there's a lot of multiple questions for one topic. Without further ado, one of the first questions that I received was, can you provide an introduction to two-phase flow? Um, Two-phase flow is something that we see a lot of whenever we're doing pressure relief systems. Not everything is just vapor, not everything is just liquid. Sometimes you're gonna have two-phase flow. So for the intents and purposes of PRS design and discussion, that two-phase flow, it doesn't, we're not talking about solids and liquids and solids and gases. We're talking about vapors or gases and liquid flow, um, sometimes together, sometimes not. Um, Two-phase flow occurs during normal processes, and it also occurs during overpressure and relief scenarios. So for instance, in normal, um, in, in normal operation, you can see um, liquid and vapor kind of mixed two-phase flow at the inlet of an LNG facility where you've got um, a mix between methane, ethane, propane, and, and butane, and, and all sorts of other hydrocarbons that may be liquid or gas, just depending on the pressures and temperatures. Um, you can have liquid carryover in the vapor overhead of a separator. Um, you can have a condenser on the overhead of a column that's condensing hot vapor and turning it back into a liquid for reflux. Um, you can also have two-phase flow during a chemical reaction. In relief scenarios, you can find it just as, just as frequently. Um, fire boiling a liquid system. So typically we think that when you have a fire causing a liquid to boil, it's gonna generate vapor, um, but sometimes you have very poor disengagement between the vapor and the liquid, so you can have two-phase flow. Or you can do what's called bottom venting, um, where you have liquid being pushed out downwards uh, if the relief path is located on the bottom of the vessel where you've got liquid first followed by vapor. Also, chemical reaction, um, and 
another good example would be blocked saturated liquid outlets. So say you've got a PSV that is attached to some hot saturated boiler feed water and there's a blocked outlet condition and you have a relief. Well, that hot liquid boiler feed water at an elevated pressure may be liquid, but as soon as it discharges to a lower pressure, it may start flashing, causing two-phase flow. Sizing for liquid is really simple. It's not compressible. We've got equations that handle it really easily. Vapor is simple. It's compressible. We've got uh, equations that can handle it pretty easily. Two-phase flow is not so simple, and it is complicated. There's several reasons it's complicated. It's because you can have vaporization of saturated liquid. You can have condensation of vapor. You can have vaporization of liquid and then condensing again. And then you can have a non-condensing uh, gas mixed with the liquid. All sorts of different situations with two-phase flow. In the olden days, the approaches to sizing a pressure relief system for two-phase flow was really, really, really simple. Uh, one of the assumptions to do was just say it's all vapor. We don't, we can't really calculate it. We don't know how to do it. Let's just pretend it's all vapor. It's not really a good assumption because the liquid is not compressible, and that could lead to undersizing a relief device if you treat it as if it were a vapor. There were some improved approaches uh, that were developed. Uh, most of them follow what's called homogeneous equilibrium methods, or HEM. Um, there's also homogeneous non-equilibrium methods. Um, homogeneous just means that the phases, the, the liquid and the vapor phase, are treated as this single averaged phase. It's just treated as this, uh, like a bulk phase um, and not as two separate phases. And the equilibrium um, for the homogeneous equilibrium methods uh, refers to the equilibrium between the liquid fraction and the vapor fraction where they've got equivalent velocities and they're all moving together at you know, the same velocity and with the same mechanical energy. It's an assumption, and it helps us do the sizing, um, but there's some caveats with it that we'll talk about in a second. So going a little bit deeper into homogeneous equilibrium, um, one example is the omega method. I think a lot of folks are familiar with this. They've seen it in um, a lot of sizing guidance and documentation like API 520 Part 1. It's a numerical approximation of, of what's known as an, uh, a nozzle formula. It uses an approximation of fluid density changes as a fluid travels from upstream of a relief valve to downstream of a relief valve. But the omega method is kind of tricky to use if you've got rapid phase changes across that valve. There's a cleaner method, and that's the direct integration method. Um, it's an integrative method um, for fluid flow through the in, across the entire thermodynamic path through a nozzle. The omega method was developed several years ago because it was easier to calculate, but in modern times, it's, it's just as easy and, and probably a little bit better to use a direct integration method because we've got the capability to do it. The caveat with, e, with the equilibrium methods is that they don't include slip into sizing. So if you can imagine you've got these two phases flowing, you've got a boiling liquid, and you've got some fraction that's liquid, and you've got some fraction that's vapor, it's not necessarily going to stay stagnant. The vapor fraction is not going to stay the same as you depressurize. As you depressurize, you may experience additional boiling, and so you've got this, this vapor fraction which is increasing. Well, there's a volume associated with it, and that volume will change faster and cause that vapor fraction to travel at a higher velocity then your liquid may be traveling, and because those are no longer in equilibria, you have what's called slip. The HEM methods ignore that, so there's homogeneous non-equilibrium methods which don't ignore it and account for it. They're a little bit less common and not really used um, extensively because they are more complicated. Another question that I got for two-phase flow is that if you believe that you've got two-phase flow, is there a single method best suited to calculating the required relief area? I would argue, yeah, I would say direct integration is a very suitable and contemporary approach um, as long as you've got a simulator uh, for your fluid properties. A lot of the commercial sizing software out there will do direct integration for you, although it is covered in API 520 Part 2 in the annexes. Uh, there it is, Appendix C. So you can find additional information about two-phase uh, flow sizing in API Standard 521 Part 1, Appendix C. 
Another question, how should the inlet and discharge piping be modeled since no software that I'm aware of for modeling two-phase flow in pipes exists? I would argue that many of the commercial relief device software applications out there do offer pressure drop calculations for two-phase flow, and I would also argue that a lot of the process simulators do as well. Whether or not they do it very well or realistically is another question, though. Um, so there's obvious caveats. We talked about slip a few moments ago. Um, that phenomenon may not be captured by the pressure drop formulae that are utilized by those programs. Um, homogeneous flow may be assumed, and so it may not catch the changes in vapor volume versus liquid volume as you're flowing through the pipe uh, very well, and the pressure loss associated with that. And then again, with any pressure drop calculations, there's always this inherent uncertainty in the pressure drop correlations, and that's true even for single phase. This is a, a long, this, this question is a mouthful, but I wanted to capture the entire question. When using Lung's Omega method, the technique involves taking the process conditions at the pressure relief valve inlet and then comparing them with process conditions at a lower pressure. It's assumed that this two process point comparison will represent the behavior of the mixture as the pressure drops through the opening of the pressure relief valve. The process conditions, such as the density or specific volume at the inlet of the valve are known parameters from those specified on the PRV data sheet based on the set pressure. The second process data point required is the density or specific volume of the mixture at 90% of the flowing pressure or the relief pressure. There's reference to determine this data point from a process simulation flash calculation since one needs to know the vapor mass fraction. What's the best way to do it? So for the fluid properties at 90% of the flowing pressure, which is 90% of the relief pressure, one may use an adiabatic and reversible path, an isentropic path, where you keep your entropy the same. The reason you can take the isentropic path as, a, as opposed to like a constant enthalpy path or an isenthalpic path um, is that we like to approximate flow through a relief valve as if it were a well-formed nozzle. In practice, the way to go about doing this, um, and this is for any generic simulator, it's kind of step-by-step, -step, really simple. Um, go ahead and gather all the fluid properties you have at the relief condition from your process simulator um, so that you're fixing your relief pressure as the, as the absolute pressure, um, and then you're fixing your temperature based on whatever the process condition happens to be, fire or blocked outlet or, or whatever, whatever it is. So go ahead, get those conditions. You're going to be able to find the specific entropy at that point. It can be the specific entropy on a mass basis, a molar basis, what have you. Copy it down. Now, since you've fixed your pressure and your temperature, you've kind of locked out everything else. You've, you can't specify anything else. Well, from there, go ahead and delete the pressure specification and change it to 90% of the absolute relief pressure and then delete your temperature specification and then go specify that specific entropy that you copied for the first state. Once you do that, you're going to be able to um, see what the resultant temperature is because really that's the thing that you don't know. You know what 90% of the pressure is, you don't know what the temperature is going to be or how the rest of the, the fluid is going to act, but if you fix your pressure and you fix your entropy as, as fixed, then you can get those parameters that you need for the omega method sizing. Next question for two-phase flow. For PSVs where two-phase flow is possible, will using the HEM always result in the most conservative PSV design? This is a tricky question. The reason I think it's tricky is because the word always sounds very absolute, and I don't like speaking in, in absolute. The other thing is that we're talking about being conservative. Um, I, we should be cautious about being overly conservative in sizing because it can lead to oversizing, which in PSVs can cause its own set of problems. The other thing is that HEM will not necessarily provide the most conservative results, but it can provide some appropriate results. And I think that there's a couple of different ways that you can skin that cat. Um, if you want to be conservative with two-phase flow, then consider lowering the coefficient of discharge. There's a couple of different, in, inside of that, there's a couple of different ways that you can be conservative and, and change the way that you approximate your coefficient of discharge for two-phase flow. If you want to be really conservative, you could use the liquid coefficient of discharge 
And if you want to be really non-conservative, you could use the vapor coefficient of discharge, although I would not recommend it. Um, but you can, be, you can be conservative by just changing that coefficient. Um, you could also just increase the required relief load. If you, if you feel like it, you could, I don't know, increase it 10% if you feel like it. That would make your result more conservative, but not necessarily more appropriate. Moving on to the second topic, discharge location and effluent handling. One of our questions is, outside of API 521, what methods or reference material recommends RAGAGAP, that's recommended and generally acceptable good engineering practice, design guidance for proper location of relief devices, discharge points, and when to install more elaborate discharge handling systems? Now, I would love to give a really, really complex and thorough answer to this, but I, I can't do that, but I can provide some general guidance. Um, as far as installation is concerned, you might also want to take a look at API Standard 520 Part 2. But I'll also say that you can refer to uh, the CCPS's brand new, this is a brand spanking new book that has just recently been published after a couple of years of, uh, of being on hold. It's the Guidelines for Pressure Relief and Effluent Handling Systems. It says it right there in the title, Effluent Handling Systems. This is a second edition. This is going to be a, an amazing book. And so if you've got the resources, if, you've got, if, you've, if you can pull the right strings at your company, go ahead and get this book. Take a look at the recommendations. Take a look at what the latest industry zeitgeist says about effluent handling systems. Users can also find additional RAGAGAP for discharge location and effluent handling systems from any number of different process or industry-specific guidelines. One example that just comes to mind is API 2510, which is uh, for LPG storage. That document itself contains guidance on discharge location, where you should have your discharge, what should and should not go into the discharge, things like that. Um, different applications like ammonia, you're going to find specific documentation for ammonia. You may find specific documentation for cryogenic gas. Um, it just depends on the industry and the process. There's numerous documents that you can go and take a look at. Um, but I'd say maybe, maybe CCPS's guidelines for pressure relief and effluent handling systems is a good place to start. Third topic, rupture disks. This one was a really, really popular topic. Um, first question, could you please discuss in detail about the data that are listed in the tag of a rupture disk? I have some doubts in particular about the tolerances that are indicated there. So as some of you may know, um, rupture disks are, are constructed with a tolerance, a burst tolerance called the manufacturing range. Um, a manufacturing range of zero means that there's zero tolerance in the burst pressure. You say that it's going to burst at 100 PSIG at some operating temperature of, say, 100 Fahrenheit. I'm just making it up. Um, then that disk is guaranteed to burst at that pressure only, nowhere above, nowhere below. Now there's additional ranges. And if you go higher and higher on your on your um, on this manufacturing range, then your disk is going to be cheaper and cheaper because it doesn't have to be as as pre precisely constructed. Um, but every disk has a has a manufacturing range. And so, if you were to take a look at a a generic API 520 um, specification sheet for a rupture disk, you can see this in the bottom right hand corner where it says rupture disk, and it has line 41, 42, 43, all this jazz on it. Um, you can find what that designated manufacturing design range is. So if you've got any particular doubts about the range that is stamped on the actual disk itself, the tag that's attached to the disk that's installed in the field, um, go ahead and call the manufacturer. Call and ask if you can speak with one of their engineers or um, one of their technical sales folks and just start a dialogue, start a conversation. If you've got doubts, tell them your doubts. Find out more information from those folks because they're the ones that built it. They should be able to answer your, answer your questions and, and uh, maybe solve those doubts. And if you've just got a tag on the disk, well, maybe go take a look and see if you can find the original specification sheet. That spec sheet may contain more information than you can see just on the tag. Another rupture disc question, when should I use a rupture disc versus a relief valve and vice versa? Really, really, really good question. So there's some times when you can use a standalone rupture disc. Um, 
if the PSV is too costly. If a PSV costs way too much and you can use a rupture disk, try it. If a PSV does not fit where you want it to, if a PSV suffers really high pressure drop, uh, disks are different than PSVs because once they burst, it's essentially just an open pipe. Uh, it's, there's no worry about it reclosing like a PSV, especially because of something like inlet pressure drop or, or back pressure effects. Use a rupture disk if the process will not suffer unduly from continuous effluent loss. So with any sort of relief device that doesn't close again, it's going to be open and it's going to stay open until somebody isolates the process, turns it off, and then replaces that disk. Also, use a rupture disk if your system needs to open quickly. Um, disks are considered, and the rupture disk manufacturers will tell you this, they're considered to open really, really quickly, faster than PSVs, although some PSVs can probably open just as fast. Um, but also, if you've got some really nasty systems that um, should not go through a torturous relief path, like a, through the internals of a PSV, if they need a direct outlet, then consider using a rupture disk. Um, polymerizing chemical reactions is, is maybe a good example of this, where you don't want to gunk up your PSV, you just need an open flow path. There's other instances where you should use a PSV in combination with a rupture disk, um, either on the inlet of the PSV or on the inlet and the outlet of the PSV. When should you do this? If you can't pay to have a PSV made of something that can withstand really, really corrosive service. Um, for instance, you can shield a PSV from really corrosive service um, with a cheap rupture disk. If the system is toxic and isolation from the effluent system must be guaranteed during normal operation, so you want to make sure that that PSV never, ever leaks, use a rupture disk. If the service spontaneously polymerizes when mixed with foreign material that it might find in the effluent system, again, this goes back to leaking PSVs. I think butadiene is a really good example. Um, one, you shouldn't be sending butadiene to atmosphere, so they usually, I mean, they have to go to a flare system. The other thing is that if there's any oxygen in the flare system for whatever reason and butadiene comes into contact with it, it can uh, polymerize into what's called popcorn polymer, and you might not know it, and it can cause blockage in your effluent handling system, so it's good to isolate it with rupture disks on the inlet of the PSV. When should you not use a rupture disk? Never use a rupture disk for pulsating service, never on a positive displacement pump or compressor discharge or suction for that matter. Um, those systems, even though they kind of have this average pressure that they're always putting out, they do have, there's, if you zoom in, if you, if you increase, uh, if you, I don't know, zoom in on it, you'll see that it's up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, because these are reciprocating machines in most cases, and that constant pulsation will weaken a rupture disk and cause it to burst. So they're not very good in those applications. Also, if you've got services that experience really large temperature swings that might wear out the metal um, of a rupture disc prematurely, certain disc materials are okay for this, um, but a lot are not. And then also avoid rupture disc if you have a service that can experience like a water hammer or a steam hammer effect when you have a spike in pressure. Um, that can cause nuisance ruptures, so you might find PSV, sorry, you may find rupture disks installed on um, exchangers on the cooling water side, and if you turn off your cooling water circuit and you turn the pumps back on, you might have a, a water hammer effect, which can cause that disk to burst. Another question, is there any issue with oversizing a burst, bursting disk uh, bigger than what's necessary aside from the cost? Uh, the answer is, I don't know, I guess, I guess not, not really. Um, so as long as you keep in mind the limitations of rupture disks um, and keep in mind the fact that it's not just the cost of the disk, it's also the cost of the piping that you have to construct uh, to pipe to and pipe away from the rupture disk, you might be okay to have a, a large rupture disk, larger than necessary. Another question on rupture disks. For rupture disks, there's a lot of documentation to manage. How do, you man how do you recommend managing all the documentation? Um, specifically like spares and inventory, rupture disk design, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. I would say there's, a, there's no magic bullet to this. Just utilize the same tools that you've got already in place. Assign a functional location if you have not already. 
Um, I've seen some facilities where rupture discs are not treated as, uh, I guess they're not treated seriously. They're not given a functional location. Not a, there's no tag number associated with it. It's just treated like a, a piping component, which makes it really hard to track. Um, so functional location first. Design information should be kept with the rest of the relief system design information. So whoever's in charge of that, give it to them for maintenance. Make sure it gets on a maintenance schedule that meets the manufacturer's recommendations as well as your facility's requirements. For inventory, just work with your warehouse. Make sure you put expiration dates on things because though some of the materials don't last forever. You need to replace them. And that's that. Uh, question, next question, can a fragmenting or graphite rupture disc be used upstream of a PSV? Um, that is not advisable. So a fragmenting disc in combination with the PSV is not really a good idea because the disc fragments can get stuck in the PSV, which can damage the PSV or cause it not to reclose. Um, so generally not a good idea. Next topic, overpressure scenarios. How do I define my scenarios like external fire, overpressure, runaway reaction, all that stuff for release device design and how do I select the governing scenario? Awesome question. Uh, to define the scenarios, you've got to start with your list of typical scenarios, like those provided by API 521, um, and then anything else that your process might be subject to, um, certain chemical reactions, things like that. Consult people that know this, the system or the process well to see if there's anything outside of those generic scenarios. Another good place to start, take a look at the latest PHA. The PHA has scenarios which can be correlated to overpressure scenarios that you might otherwise miss. So go ahead and check the PHA. So for each of those scenarios, you must provide a rationale. Why does it apply? Why does it not apply? Both of those are really, really important. And you gotta make sure that the documentation is, district, is descriptive and auditable because you don't wanna do it and then somebody comes around five years later and says, I don't understand what they did. There's no explanation and causing them to have to redo it. Good example, like provide a lot of technical descriptive language, and you're gonna save yourself and your colleagues time in the future. So you got a good example there, and then a bad example. Never write something like, this scenario does not apply because it doesn't, period. Don't do that. It's not audible, auditable and it's not helpful to anybody. So you've qualified all your scenarios that apply. Now you have to do the sizing calculations for the scenarios that apply. The governing, quote unquote, governing scenario is really, is often the one that has the largest sizing requirement. There's a caveat because the inlet and outlet pressure drops associated with all of the applicable scenarios also cause you to make certain design choices. So one scenario may control the size of the PSV, but another scenario may control the inlet and outlet piping design consideration. You've got to consider all of it holistically. Next topic, vendor sizing. What are some things to be wary of when asking a vendor to perform relief device design calculations and sizing? So for the intents and purposes of this question, let's assume that the term vendor refers to a relief device manufacturer and the people that sell them, not like a technology vendor or, a, or an engineering outfit that provides engineering services. Vendors only know as much as what you tell them Really good vendors can kind of anticipate what you're going to need, but they're not mind readers. And I'll exemplify this with a silly example. So you walk into a car dealership and you tell a saleswoman, I need a car to get to work. Saleswoman's like, oh, okay, I've got a McLaren P1 here. It can get you to work pretty fast. And by the way, it costs a million dollars. You're like, okay, awesome. Does it fit two car seats? It's like, no, don't be silly. Um, if you want something that fits car seats, how about a Mercedes G63 wagon? It get, get you to work fast and it can accommodate multiple car seats. Okay, can I get a hybrid tax rebate on it? Saleswoman's like, no, it's not a hybrid. Do you want a hybrid? And you tell the, the saleswoman, the vendor, yeah, I thought you were supposed to read my mind. Saleswoman says, okay, fine. How about a Toyota Prius? It's a hybrid, it can get you to work and you can put car seats in it. Can it tow 12,000 pounds? Then the saleswoman tells you to get lost. The idea is that vendors only know as much as they tell them. So the vendors will perform sizing based on the information that you give to them, um, but that's it, period. They're not gonna be able to go and do all of the sizing scenarios for you because 
the amount of information that they can see is very limited. They don't have an entire set of PNIDs that you're going to provide them, and it's not within their realm to do that engineering analysis for you. So they will not provide rationalization, a list of alternative design considerations, release conditions beyond what you already provided to them, detailed two-phase flow calculations beyond what you provided, pressure drop calculations, none of it. What I've seen before is that vendor sizing, like the spec sheet, that's usually the, the deliverable from a vendor besides the PSB itself, is the spec sheet. That is not a relief system design basis. I've been told by individuals in the past, like, okay, here's my design basis, and it's just a spec sheet. That does not count, does not count. So be aware of that. Next big topic, external fire. So. First question, in lieu of using, and this is, a, this is a really, really good question, in lieu of using the static heat flux provided by generic external fire calculations, so for a little bit of background, if you look at API 521, it provides some guidance on doing, say, open pool fires, and basically you determine your heat input to your system based on your wetted surface area and a generic number for your heat influx. One of the numbers is based on if you've got adequate drainage and firefighting capabilities, and the other one is, is is if you don't have those things, but it's fairly static. So the question that this person is asking, is there something else that we can use? Because what if I don't have that much fuel to burn? Also, um, what if the, the heat flux from the fire is not as severe as what is given inside of kind of these generic equations inside of 521? Is there something else we can use? Well, the answer is, yeah, um, there's another quote unquote established practice that's alternative to the generic empirical static heat flux. Um, and it's one that's described in Annex A of API Standard 521 sixth edition. Um, this is the latest edition, and this was an, uh, this was an addition to the edition. Um, and it's in the Annex, and it describes um, not the empirical approach, but a, an alternative analytical approach, um, which is probably a good starting point for the person who asked this question. Go take a look at it you can take a look at different heat flux into your system. As far as the time variable, like how much fuel do you have and how long is it gonna burn, it doesn't preclude that. Um, so you can probably work it in there somehow as long as you do good engineering work and you're, and uh, I don't know, you're honest and somebody checks your work, you could probably do that. Next topic, reactive system sizing. Question, is there an optimal technique for sizing a relief system for a common use reactor system where the container will have similar processes, similar volumes, but each reaction will be unique and different with different products and different byproducts? Eh. There's probably not one simple trick um, to solve that problem. And in all honesty, in, in all honesty a good relief system design basis is going to include the rationale for each of the possible chemical reaction scenarios as well as during that scenario, which is the worst possible thing to happen. For instance, fire or uh, temperature ramp up is too fast. So you've really got to have a basis for all of it. A really, the best case scenario in order to save time and money um, is one in which the predicted peak pressures from each of those potential chemical runaway reactions are less than the reactor's MAWP or MAAP, the maximum allowable accumulation pressure. And the reason for that is that you can qualify a scenario, but if you've got a really, really high MAWP that can withstand the maximum pressure exerted by that chemical reaction, well, you may be protected by design. You don't, need, you don't have an applicable scenario that can cause relief. Of course, having a really strong reactor vessel may make a lot of sense for certain smaller scales, but maybe it doesn't make sense if you're doing all these wild, crazy different batch operations with different, chemical, different chemicals and, and products and byproducts if it's a very large scale system. Um, having a really high MAWP reactor may be econ economically unfeasible. However, second to that, I think you're probably left to do the sizing for each of the possible worst case scenarios for the given stoichiometry. Um, as far as the model to kind of use to do your sizing, a kinetic model uh, can be really robust. Um, and you can have variation on a couple of different conditions, um, but the old analytical methods can work for fixed starting conditions. So, I mean, if you've got to do the sizing, you've got to do the sizing. It's important that you document everything, though, no matter what. 
Another question on reactive systems, what instrumentation software is useful for quantifying necessary vent sizing parameters? It's a very subtle question because vent sizing parameter, it looks innocuous, like it doesn't, it doesn't really cause anybody to, to get really excited unless you know that it may be referring to the information required for reactive system sizing, like pressure rise rate. So for reactive systems, that, that information, you can probably get it, um, I think they'll maybe quote, I'm, I'm gonna use air quotes, latest and greatest things you can use are probably an ARC or a VSP2. And you can look those up online. Those are different technologies to capture those parameters. Waste heat recovery unit. What strategy could one take when designing overpressure protection for the outlet of a waste heat boiler or a waste heat recovery unit, uh, for instance, uh, sulfur condensing process used to produce 400 pound steam. So in certain processes, you're trying to pull sulfur H2S out of your, out of your stuff that you wanna sell, out of your, you know, your gasoline and your diesel and everything else, and you wanna take that H2S and the other sulfur components and, and get elemental sulfur out of it because you can sell elemental sulfur to somebody else. Part of that process is to take um, hot gaseous sulfur and then condense it so that you can you know, process condensed, cooled down sulfur. In doing that, when you're removing that heat, you can use that, uh, you can recover that heat, capture it and, and generate steam, which is useful elsewhere as a utility. The problem that comes up though, um, is because a lot of older, well, I'd say a lot of installations, at least here in the United States, um, these waste heat recovery units were built um, in the past where the low pressure side is the sulfur side, the high pressure side is the boiler, is the boiler side, um, but if you have a loss of containment because of a tube rupture or a mechanical failure like that, then you can introduce really, really high pressure steam um, into a really, really low pressure system and cause um, some really bad stuff to happen. And th there have been documented cases of this where the older designs have, have failed because of, uh, of tube shock where the boiler feed water level went down really, really low and somebody's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we don't have any boiler feed water. Open up the boiler feed water valve and then they shock these really, really hot tubes with cold water, um, which causes a failure. So how do you protect against that from an overpressure standpoint? It's really difficult, I'll tell you that. So newer designs design the problem away by ensuring that the low pressure side is designed at a high enough MAWP to withstand a tube rupture. Um, but the older designs are left with a few remedies. None of them are awesome, um, but this is what I've seen. One is to take credit for relief through the sulfur seal legs. Another is to, in, to, in, another is to install a rupture disc on the low pressure side. Although with that, you've got to worry about, okay, if I've got a rupture disc there, is it gonna get, is it gonna get filled with elemental sulfur on the inlet? Is it gonna rupture when it needs to? If it does go, um, am I protected against is there potential H2S in my effluent that could get into my, wherever my downstream system is? Same for the sulfur legs. If it goes to a sulfur pit, you may have H2S going to your sulfur pit if it goes to the sulfur legs. Um, other approaches are really to mitigate the risk of the tube rupture operationally. Um, other solutions, buy a new waste heat recovery unit. Um, this is a, a situation that's part of ongoing discussions um, with what's called the Brimstone STS Sulfur Recovery Symposia, which is held, I think, yearly in Colorado. And then uh, it's discussed from time to time at the API subcommittees on pressure relieving systems for 521. Moving on, number nine, installation. So I've heard that simply placing a relief valve on its side can cause misalignment of the seats. Is it true that I always need to install the PSV in an upright position? Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, it's a true story. When the vendor says to install it in the vertical upright position, you should probably do it. Um, and the reason, just, just paint a mental picture. Assume you've got a big giant PSV, like an 8T10, weighs 500, 600 pounds, lay it on its side. About half of the mass of that PSV is in the spring in the bonnet. Now that's supposed to be vertical and upright, causing that spring uh, mass to sit on top of that seat in addition to you know, the spring uh, force itself. But if it's on its side, you could imagine that this, that this giant spring might sag a little bit. Um, and if it's sagging, is it losing its seal? Um, the answer is maybe. 
you probably shouldn't install it like that. Um, I wouldn't risk it. However, there are certain small devices, particularly small devices, that I've seen installed in a number of different orientations, um, but that's only because it's okay per the vendor to do so. Typically, these are not like the generic uh, API 526 valves that we see, like the you know, conventional spring-loaded or the pilots or whatever. These are kind of the funny little PSVs that you see sometimes. Just depends on what the manufacturer says. Questions about chemical engineering students. Uh, as a senior year student and soon to be a process engineer, well, congratulations, what aspects of release systems should I be well versed with? Would you recommend any specific courses or books related to release systems um, before turning into a fully fledged chemical engineer? Well, this, this guy or girl is really excited about release systems, I'll tell you what, you don't see that all the time. So chemical engineering students and recent graduates are not expected to be well versed in relief systems. There's no way, no how. However, they should be well versed in the things that you would expect. Technical communication is a big one. I think that's probably, well for me, personally, that's one of the most important, if not the most important. Obviously, you need to be versed in mass transfer heat transfer, fluid mechanics, thermo. As far as books or courses, if your degree program has a process safety as an elective or a requirement, even better if it's a requirement, but if it's an elective, take advantage of it. As far as book, books go, um, I wouldn't call them light reading, but I think some of the most easily digestible reading is stuff by um, author Trevor Kletz. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago, but he has written a number of really, really good books on process safety, including pressure relief topics. So I'd take a look at, at what there is from Trevor Kletz. Moving on, piping. Does pressure relief need to be provided for B313 piping systems to protect against external fire? This is a really good question. Answer? No, not really. It's very atypical that it is. Materials of construction. Can you highlight the need to have proper materials of construction for a relief system for relief systems components in a given service? I'll be honest, I'm not a materials engineer, but my experience tells me that you should make friends with a materials engineer. And you should also consult a manufacturer for soft goods and metals compatibility for the service conditions that you're trying to design for. Um, certain metals are not good in certain services. Um, either because of temperature or because of the components of the service. Um, really acidic services or really corrosive services, um, those all play into the materials that you need to select. And you probably, if you're just a, a plain Jane chemical engineer, you probably need the help of somebody with a little bit more expertise. Uh, it's also really good to know your piping specifications. Robust piping specifications will have all of this philosophy built into the piping specifications, which can help you with material selection for PSVs and piping components attached to that PSV. Next topic, shell and tube exchangers. If both the shell and the tubes of an exchanger are ASME Section 8 code stamped, is a separate PSV required for both vessels? Does it make a difference if they have different MAWPs? So a relief system's design basis and overpressure protection must be provided for both sides of the exchanger. That doesn't mean you have to install a PSV though. For example, on the shell side, if it's part of a cooling water supply and return circuit and there's an indirect path to atmosphere, you can take credit for that indirect path to atmosphere as, as your relief device. It doesn't need to be a PSV, but there should be a design basis and overpressure pressure protection for both sides. Now there was another question about the MAWPs. The MAWPs of either side of the exchanger may rule out or rule in certain overpressure scenarios. So for instance, when we take a look at tube rupture, we often look at the highest pressure that the high pressure side can operate at versus the MAWP or the test pressure of the low pressure side. Now if the, if the high pressure side operates at a pressure that's way higher than the, than the low pressure side's uh, MAWP, then we can say, yeah, that scenario applies and we have to size for it. But if the two MAWPs are the same, well, that scenario goes away. It doesn't apply anymore, at least not for the exchanger. So yes, it does matter if they have different MAWPs, 
but yeah, it still matters if they have the same MAWPs because you still have to do your rationalization for scenarios that hinge on the MAWP of both sides. Question 14, can the overpressure protection by design provision of ASME Section 8 UG140 be applied to a heat exchanger that's already been designed, built, and stamped? For example, can UG140 apply to an existing heat exchanger that has been moved to a new service if the heat exchanger was not originally stamped using UG140? This is a, I wouldn't call this a sticky question, um, but this is something that a lot of plants run into because they do exactly what's described in this question. They change the service of something or they change the process conditions of something such that there's really no source of overpressure no matter what. And so we like to look at ASME section at UG140 um, to see if we can weasel our way out of having to have a PSV attached to a, an exchanger. But the language of UG140 is really, really clear. The manufacturer's data report must indicate that the vessel is protected from overpressure by system design. This is really frequent, as I mentioned. Um, there's a multiple approaches depending on the circumstances to kind of satisfy this requirement. I'll say satisfy, I'll also say get around this requirement, although get around is kind of, eh, probably wanna avoid just getting around it. Um, so questions you might ask yourself, is this thing located in an ASME 8 state um, or is it located elsewhere, like Texas? Texas is an ASME Section 1 state. It is not an ASME Section 8 state. So our state law has ASME Section 1 incorporated in it. We've got boiler inspectors that come around and take a look at boilers, but, but not the same for pressure vessels that are built to ASME Section 8. Other states do have that, and it's built into their state law that you've got to follow that Section 8 stuff. There's also the question about citation risk tolerance. So in a perfect world, you could, you could take this exchanger that we're talking about and do the design analysis and do all the, all the review that's required to rule out any potential overpressure scenario, but it can be a real nuisance to take care of that, that first requirement. Um, so, I don't know, it just, you can probably get around all of it if you spend the time to do it. Getting towards the end, ask me uh, boiler pressure of vessel code question. Do the pressure relief requirements of BPVC apply to existing pressure vessels or only to new pressure vessels? Generally, the pressure relief requirements of the code to which the vessel was built apply and retroactivity of current code does not. However, it can be argued that contemporary pressure relief requirements are important to consider when using equipment built to design codes that no longer exist. This is a question that's come up frequently enough that OSHA has an interpretation for it because OSHA wants to be able to interpret RAGAGAP correctly. Um, and so this is pulled from one of their latest memorandums, which was uh, from the summer of 2016. Basically, older covered equipment may not have been designed and constructed with applicable RAGAGAP, like stuff that's from today. Um, that old stuff may no longer exist and no longer be in use. However, summary, it's, you've got to determine that the documenta determine and document that your equipment is designed, maintained, inspected, and tested, and operating in a safe manner. If you can document that you're doing those things, um, if you're using like an older coded vessel or something like that, as long as you can show and document that it's safe, you're probably in the clear. Moving on to one of the last topics, seats. What are the benefits of soft seats versus metal seats? Soft seats are primarily used to minimize leakage. That's it. Question, how much leakage can be expected from a PSV? Well, it really depends on the set pressure. Um, minimal leakage should be expected, although there are guidelines set forth in API Standard 527 which specify seat tightness and how much leaking is allowable in order to conform to 527. Nameplates. When a PSV may relieve both vapor and liquid during relief scenarios, which should appear on the nameplate? Really good question. The controlling scenario, uh, for instance, scenario that governs the size of the pressure relief device, um, is usually used to determine which stamp to use. But really, it, it, the choice belongs to the end user. Um, vapor trim valves typically should probably be stamped in vapor. Liquid trim valves should be stamped in liquid. Steam valves should be stamped in steam. 
If the nameplate of a PSV is removed or destroyed, does the PSV need to be replaced? I would really hope not because it sounds really, really expensive. I'd get a hold of the manufacturer or a certified valve shop and determine whether or not that valve can be retrofitted with a new or replacement nameplate, uh, not a brand new PSV, although I'm sure they'd love to sell you one. Um, that concludes all the questions uh, that I was able to answer today. We've got some release systems training that's coming up in about a month. Um, we cover a lot of the questions that we talked about today as well as many, many others. Um, that's going to be in Houston in April 17th through 19th. Um, I got some information about pricing there. There's group discounts available. Um, give us a call and we can talk about it if you've got additional questions. And then now we've got, sorry Pam, we've got like seven minutes for additional questions and answers because everybody loves Q&A, so there's got to be some Q&A for the Q&A. Sure. I, we've got some time and we've got a few questions. Do you have any information right. for relief systems in wood products processing, like for dust deflagration? Ooh, dust de deflagration. So I'm familiar with the subject. I'm in, in no means an expert um, for combustible dust and sizing those explosion panels and things related to that. Um, I will take this, and I didn't mention it earlier, but any of these questions that get asked, I'm going to try to provide a short answer and provide it with the, the PDF that we published to the AICHE website. So I'll take that question, see what I can drum up as a short answer and provide it then. Good question though. Okay, thanks. Is there, difference, is there a difference between the terms pressure relief valve and pressure safety valve? Yes, so um, safety, they are used interchangeably all the time, very frequently, um, although safety refers to gas and relief refers to liquid. But a lot of people just say PSV, no matter what, interchangeably. Okay, great. Talking about PSV and rupture disc combination, I have a question. Can we have a rupture disc and PSV combination on a reboiler in butadine service? Is it a dirty service PSV case? For butadiene, it is, it is not dirty as long as you keep foreign contaminants out of it and you ensure that you're not going to have polymerization in the effluent handling system, especially on the inlet um, or the outlet. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but I think that rupture discs may be advisable but again, we're talking about reboilers. If there's any sort of temperature swings, you've got to be careful with that. You've got to have a resilient metal. Um, but yeah, I think I answered the question. Okay, thanks. Could you briefly speak about HIPPS, High Integrity Pressure Protection System, and the challenges associated with using HIPPS in lieu of a PCV? So using HIPS in lieu of um, a PSV is a really good question. It is one that's going to take more time than I think we've got for the rest of the questions. I can provide a short answer to that one um, when we get this published. Okay, thanks. In the scenario where there is a pump around exchanger with flow coming to the exchanger via a pump from the tower and returning to the tower through a control valve, what is the approach for relief design during the fire scenario? So fire design for, I guess, for the heat exchanger. Um, well, if the heat exchanger is freely draining to the tower and you don't expect, actually, you might not be able to guarantee that you're going to be able to get that liquid out. So it depends on the situation. It also depends whether or not that PS, the, the control valve is in the fire zone, if it's exposed to the fire, what's going to happen to the pump. But if you've got any liquid that's going to stay in that exchanger and it's going to be exposed to fire, you might be in trouble. You might have to size for the fire case. Okay, thank you. What if the vendor has said sideways or upside down installation will not affect the PSV operation? Then it sounds like you can probably install it any, any orientation you'd like, although maybe upside down or exactly horizontal is, is what I would limit it to. I wouldn't install it at any bizarro angle. It sounds like it would be fine if you've got a, a, a semblance of guarantee from the vendor. Okay, thanks. Can an oversized rupture disc exceed allowed pressure drop across a system? So the, the pressure drop across a rupture disc doesn't really affect the rupture disc. 
What it will affect is the capacity of, the, of that piping system attached to the rupture disc. Um, being oversized, the answer is probably not. If you've got an oversized disc, it's less restrictive than a smaller disc, assumably. Um, and so it would cause less concern with pressure drop and capacity than a smaller one. Um, that's it. Okay, thank you. For rupture discs, is there a maintenance inspection, inspection frequency that looks at buildup of contaminants or materials that may hinder it opening at specified temperature and pressure? Um, the answer is yes. So the manufacturer is always going to make suggestions on how often you should take a look and just flat out replace those discs or take a look at them. Um, but the vendor is not going to be aware of everything going on inside of your process. So if you have that institutional knowledge inside your own uh, facility or your company or whatever that says, hey, this service causes problems um, in, our, in our witch hat filters and it causes problems in our rupture disks, you may have some inspection frequencies and replacement frequencies which exceed the recommendations from the manufacturer. Um, so I think the short answer is yes to the question. Okay. Are you aware of other sources of probability of failure on demand data? on demand data for PSVs other than CCPS or how organizations may capture this information? It is organizationally dependent. A lot of people will look at something like kind of an industry, as an, you know, treat it as an industry standard uh, to look at somewhere like CCPS where you've got a whole bunch of folks um, that are familiar with, with this familiar of, of probability of failure on demand of PSVs. Um, I don't have a really good answer aside from the things that the, the person asking the question is already aware of. Okay. For, I don't think you answered this one. For an unrelated scenario where there is a control valve, and stop me if you did, in the normal process flow path, and the control valve itself is not in a fire zone, is any credit taken for flow through this valve during a fire scenario for the equipment? This question gets into consulting because there, there's, there's this and, and that reason. If it's not inside the, inside the zone, it, I have seen that it is typical to take credit, regardless of whether or not it's a fire scenario, to take credit for a normal amount of flow out of a system if that control system is not expected to act any differently than it normally does, given a fire, given any other situation. However, um, the flip side of that is that gen general guidance is to not take any sort of um, credit for the favorable response of control systems to a release scenario. Um, it gets into consulting, so it's kind of difficult to give a, the, a very straightforward answer to that question, although it is a, it is a typical question that does come up a lot. Okay, thanks for that answer. I'm sorry, but that's all the time we have for the Q&A after the Q&A, but we got through a lot of them. So now, oh, before I thank you, I want to say that if anyone still has a question, they can send it to producer at AICHE.org, and I'll forward it to Justin. So now, on behalf of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and everyone who attended today, I'd like to thank Justin Phillips for this informative presentation. I think the format worked really nicely of the questions getting sent in. Thanks also to our participants for your cooperation and thoughtful questions. During the webinar, please visit AICHE.org to replay this or to view and sign up for our many other webinars. A reminder to also please fill out the evaluation form that will appear on the screen when you log out. Goodbye, and we hope to see you again in a webinar soon.